Well, welcome back. It's so good to be back with you today. We've been through a series of Bible studies as we looked at God's Word together at relevant topics, topics that are really relevant for the season that we're in together. First time we were together, we talked about influence. Then we talked about hope. We talked about the trials and the troubles we go through in life. And even before that, we talked about anger. You've probably experienced some of each of those over the last several weeks. Today, I want to talk about another topic relevant for us during this season. It's the topic of kindness. Maybe you've seen this before. The top 10 signs that you live in Oklahoma. Number 10, you have a strong opinion on which city is better, Oklahoma City or Tulsa. Number nine, you know how to properly pronounce the names of these towns, Durant, Shakota, Tonkawa, Miami. And if you say that last name like a city in Florida, we know you're not from here. Number eight, you know how to use the word fixin'. I'm fixin' to go to the lake. I'm fixin' to get out of bed any minute. Number seven, you find 90 degrees Fahrenheit a little warm. Number six, you're pure, you're pure Oklahoman when it doesn't bother you to fly out of the Oklahoma City Airport, which is named for a man who died in a plane crash. Number five, if you live in Oklahoma, Brahms and Sonic are part of our religion. Number four, you think sexy lingerie is a t-shirt and boxer shorts. Number three, if you live in Oklahoma, you know the true value of a parking space is not determined by the distance to the door, but by the availability of shade. Number two, if you love Oklahoma, you can, in the same conversation, both mercilessly mock and tirelessly defend our state. And the number one sign you live in Oklahoma, when the tornado sirens go off, you run out into the yard to get a good look at that funnel cloud. Did you know that the New Testament tells us that there are nine signs that someone is a follower of Jesus? About 30 times in the Gospels, Jesus refers to fruit. Jesus used the image of fruit to describe what kind of character a person is, who a person is, is following in their life, what that person values, and the outcome of that person is the outcome that person is producing, the very product of one's life. And so Jesus said things such as, by one's fruit, you will recognize a person. A good fruit produces good fruit, while a bad tree, a good tree produces good fruit, while a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Jesus said, you'll recognize a tree by its fruit. Whatever branch that does not bear fruit is cut away. In fact, every branch that bears fruit is pruned so it might produce more fruit. Jesus also said only when a, per, a branch produces fruit and only a, when a branch is attached to the vine can it produce fruit. He said bearing much fruit is proof of faithful discipleship. And Jesus said followers of him are chosen to produce lasting fruit. Jesus spoke about fruit. So what about these nine signs, this fruit that are indicators of a Christ follower? Paul discusses them in his letter to the Galatian Christians. In our series, we've already looked at some letters written to Christians in uh, Asia Minor. Well, Galatians is another one of, of those books. Galatia is a, is a region in uh, southern central Asia Minor, now modern day Turkey. In the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians, Paul lists the top nine signs that you're a follower of Jesus, or as we often refer to them, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. There have been times, including for me, that maybe you've done some study and consideration of these fruit of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we study those together. For this time that we have, I want us to just take a closer look at one of those fruit mentioned. One indicator among many that you are a follower of Jesus, the characteristic of kindness. Now having a biblical understanding of kindness begins with understanding the kindness of God. 
The Psalms and the, and the Proverbs and the prophets of the Old Testament consistently celebrate God's kindness, His goodness, His patience, and His mercy. With Jesus, one key reason that He instructed His disciples, how He instructed His disciples, is to love their enemies and do good to them because God Himself is kind even to the ungrateful and to the wicked. You say, what? They say, yeah, you, you heard that right. God is kind even to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Jesus makes our motivation for kindness to be God's own character of kindness, even to the wicked and to the ungrateful. By the way, I'm pretty sure that I've, I've been the recipient of that kind of grace even in my own life. As I continue, even having been a follower of Jesus, still wrestling with that old nature of wickedness and, 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 and gratitude. Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul speaks of the incomparable riches of God's grace expressed in His kindness to us through Jesus Christ. And to Titus, Paul said that it was when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us because out of that kindness, He had mercy on us. Several people in the Bible are known to be particularly kind people. And so we've looked at Ruth before in her dealing with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and recognized by her distant relative-in-law, Boaz, for her kindness. Joseph was a Hebrew person of great influence in Egypt after he, after he was taken into slavery. And Joseph acted with great authority and strength and in kindness toward those who were under his command. King David is remembered for his kindness in dealing with the family of his dear friend, Jonathan. And each one of them and others in our scriptures really make for wonderful character studies of kindness. Solomon, in determination to teach his own sons what living wisely looked like, told his sons, whoever pursues uprightness and kindness will find life and righteousness and honor. Or as Eugene, Peter, as Eugene Peterson interprets it in his message, whoever goes hunting for what is right and kind finds life itself. Would you describe yourself as a person who hunts after what is right and what is kind? Would you describe yourself as a person who pursues kindness? I'm not talking about pursuing others to be kind to you. I'm talking about your kindness. You're pursuing to be kind to other people, to be known as a person of kindness. Now, I want you to think about a person that you would describe as being genuinely kind. You know so-and-so. You know, they're, generally, they're genuinely a kind person. By the way, I often brag on others that I married the kindest person I know. That's in my wife, Cindy. The other day, I pulled off uh, on my shelf a classic book from the 1980s by Jerry Bridges. It's called The, the Practice of Godliness, a series of wonderful books that he wrote throughout the, wrote throughout the years. He was um, uh, a longtime staff member of The Navigators, and this is one of those classic books. Bridges does a great job of, of simply articulating kindness from a biblical perspective, and so he writes this. He says, kindness and goodness involve an active desire to recognize and meet the needs of others. Kindness is a sincere desire for the happiness of others. Kindness is the inner disposition created by the Holy Spirit that causes us to be sensitive to the needs of others, whether physical, emotional, or spiritual. Kindness may be as simple as a smile to a store clerk, a thank you to a waitress, an encouraging word to an elderly person, or a word of recognition to a small child. None of these expressions is costly in time or money, but they do require a sincere interest in the happiness of those around us. Apart from God's grace, most of us naturally tend to be concerned about our responsibilities, our problems, our plans, but the person who's grown in the grace of kindness has expanded his thinking outside of himself and his interests and has developed a genuine interest in the happiness and well-being of those around him. So that leads to a question, the first of many. Is kindness an optional characteristic 
for the devoted follower of Jesus. Well, Paul instructed, even charged the Ephesian Christians to be kind to one another. It's in a tense called the imperative, which makes it a command of Paul's. But is our obligation to be kind limited only to and among believers? Well, not if we understand the nature and character of the God we serve, and not if we understand that we've been created in the image of that God, and not if we understand that the redemptive work of Jesus includes restoration of that image of God in our lives. And so Paul instructed young Timothy that the Lord's servant but must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Kindness indeed is not an item on the buffet bar of spiritual fruit that we're given the, the option or the privilege of selecting based on our, own, our own, on our own desires or our spiritual dietary preferences of the moment. You see, because kindness is a visible evidence of the presence of God in our midst. Kindness then is a compulsory indicator of God's presence in his children. So what does it mean to be kind? To be kind is definitely a behavior. Certainly you've heard of the phrase random acts of kindness. So kindness has a certain behavior about it, but kindness isn't a verb. Kind and kindness is a noun. Kindness is a characteristic that leads to a certain kind of behavior. Kindness is a condition of the heart. It's something that you choose to be or you choose not to be. Now, kindness and goodness are two separate characteristics, even two different mentions of fruit in the same text in Galatians chapter 5. But kindness and goodness are interdependent qualities. Kind actions might happen without goodness at the heart, but genuine kindness is dependent upon the presence of goodness. And kindness focuses on the consideration for other people. Take, for example, the stated mission of our life together at Asbury. Now, it's a good thing to follow Jesus. It's what you and I have been invited to do straight from Scripture, straight from the heart of Jesus himself. In fact, following Jesus is what he's called us to do. It's the beginning of everything that we do as believers. Asbury's stated mission is helping others follow Jesus. As we follow Jesus, we invite others to follow Jesus with us. Others. Kindness means I intentionally choose to place my favor on another person or other people. Now that may be an innate choice with someone that I already love. To be kind to my grandkids is super easy. But how about the one that is hard to love? That annoying one, or that mean-spirited one, or that one I only cross paths with, with, path with ever so briefly? Well, most of the Old Testament was written in an ancient Hebrew language. And the English word kindness in Hebrew is chesed, and is closer, closely related to mercy and involves loyalty, mercy and loyalty. So the Hebrew understanding of kindness begins with the intentional giving of mercy to anyone we encounter. It's acknowledging that because I'm a person in need of your mercy and your grace, my default, even if I'm not know, even if I don't know you personally, is to treat you with the same mercy and the same grace that I've been given from the Lord. And again, maybe not even knowing you, just having encountered you, maybe for the first time, I'm choosing a loyalty of kindness. Now there is an agreement on who gets credit for the statement. It could be Plato, it could be Philo, it could be Socrates or someone else. It's given, it's given to different people uh, based on what you read, but it's worth remembering. Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Boy, what a great thing to remember. Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. 
Now, while the Old Testament chesed is closely related to mercy, the New Testament word for kindness is, is, is Christos. It's the reflection of a heart of compassion. Kindness is genuinely caring for another person. Again, re regardless of how well you know the person or how well you like the person, Christos, kindness, is your choice to be a reflection of the nature and the character of God by having a heart, an attitude, a behavior of favor or care for the other person. And so the Apostle Paul instructed the Colossian Christians to put on kindness then, put on as God's chosen ones, holy beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Kindness isn't just something we do. Kindness is the clothing we wear. Kindness is to embody us. Kindness is to wrap us up in its character so that our actions and our behavior toward others comes from our hearts that have been transformed into ones that look and act a lot like God himself. Now I wanna to suggest to you four action or application points for today. Number one, pursue, run after a transformation of kindness at the core of who you are from your heart so that you begin developing, being transformed into a heart of kindness. In other words, seek a transformation of your heart in kindness. For many of us, even who may have walked with Jesus for years, you may evaluate yourself and you may see within yourself, I'm not much of a kind person. Well, brother, sister, you need a transformation of your heart. You need God to develop within you to change your heart into a heart that's reflected by the fruit of kindness. Number two, when you've tended previously to react to situations in unfruitful ways to others, discipline yourself, work at yourself to respond instead with kindness. The season of COVID has been hard on all of us, very hard on many. We could use a lot of kindness around us. Now, you know as well as I do, not everyone is going to choose kindness. And those who do not choose kindness, well, of course, they're the difficult ones. But you can choose kindness. And as a follower of Jesus, I would suggest that we are obligated to choose kindness. And as a follower of Jesus, we must choose kindness. For Paul instructs us to put it on, wrap ourselves in it, wear it as a garment reflecting who we are. The biggest challenge in choosing kindness is that we have to be humble. We have to forsake what our natural reaction would be in order to react and respond in such a way that really is a reflection of the image of God within us. Number three, be kind to your spouse. If you're like me, sometimes you tend to take that other person for granted, that they're gonna love you unconditionally except who you are. Above all others, wear the garment of kindness, of compassion, of mercy, of grace with him or her. And by the way, with every family member that you live with, maybe even the roommate that you're not married to, of course, but you're, you're living with them, you share a home with them. With those closest to us, be kind to them. And then fourthly, be kind to yourself. Give yourself a break. Sometimes, you know what? You're a little bit too hard on yourself. We have really high standards for those of us who are followers of Jesus. And this is a long journey for us to follow Jesus for the rest of our lives as he continues to transform us into his image. So as you're being kind to others, remember, be kind to yourself. In 2013, cross-country running rivals Spain's Ivan Fernandez Ataya and Kenya's Abel Mutai were finishing a long distance race in which Mutai was clearly the leader of the two as they approached the finish line. 
Well, about 10 meters from the finish line, Mutai suddenly stops and begins walking, thinking that he'd already crossed the finish line. Ataya could have easily sped right past Mutai to become the victor himself. But instead, as he approached Mutai from behind, he gave him a gentle push over the finish line. Well, when he was interviewed by, by the media just a little bit later, some people were kind of perplexed why Ataya didn't just take the victory for himself. And he told them that it wasn't his to take. Mutai was the clear winner, and he wouldn't take it away from him based on a little bit of confusion at the finish line. Dear friends, this race of life is heading toward a marvelous finish line in Jesus Christ. Please don't consider that this is just your own personal victory. Let us consider many others who are, complete, who are also competing in this race, many who don't even have a clue of the journey that they're on. Life has so much confusion for many of our fellow racers. Remember this, this isn't just about me and Jesus or you and Jesus, me following Jesus. Our mission includes, even focuses on helping others follow Jesus. Kindness goes a long way when it comes to helping others follow Jesus. Kindness is a terrific companion to have in this journey together. So while it seems fewer and fewer are producing this fruit of kindness, it's indeed an essential quality for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. For us to be considered truly, fully committed followers of Jesus Christ, we must wear the fruit, wrap ourselves in the garment of kindness. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, fill us with more of yourself. Continue to renew these, um, these broken images more and more into the image of God, the image of God that we were created to walk with you in. Lord, we would it be that as you work in us, more, or more and more of us is disappearing as more and more of your fruit is growing evidently in our lives. As we follow you, remind us to grab hands with others, to urge others along in this same journey as we in turn help others follow Jesus. Through the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 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 goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Create your kindness within us that this world would know somehow through um, our own marred images that Jesus is Lord and is the hope for all the world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next time.